management, what are the options to improve the functional outcome? Herbert, you're Thank welcome. You. The moderators, ladies and gentlemen, excuse my, uh, my voice, it's a bit calm today, but I hope that it will fit for the next 15 minutes. The title is very long and uh, I would like to shorten it a bit. It's not the day after, after radical prostatectomy, as you remember the movie, it's the life after the sexual life or a bit more personal, the intimate life after the disclosures, you know. I would start with this paper from Montasi in 1979, where all the options are recommended as far as we know at that point and as far as we know nowadays when we look as on the best way to rehabilitate erectile function after radical prostatectomy. But 15 years later, the EAU guidelines, 45 sites on male sexual dysfunctions, they almost give one side of that, one of 45 sites on the point erectile dysfunction after radical prostatectomy. And there you can see that it is still the same it is intracarvanosal injection, it is PDE5 inhibitors due to the, uh, the fact that we now have three wonderful potent medicaments to rehabilitate or to reassistate erectile function. And what is the truth? And I want to take you with on a journey or a small speech with six honest serving men, as you can see it in this poem from Kipling, they told me all I know. Their names are what, why, and when, and how, and where, and who. And Dimitrius Hatsikristou, a well-known andrologist like me, and urologist, he's the well-known, not me. I'm just an andrologist. He said to that point, post-radical prostatectomy, erectile function, the five W's, and the one H. Who is considered for nerve sparing? Why is there such a discrepancy? How we define erectile dysfunction or erectile function? Where should we use the protocols? What, uh, what protocol should we consider? And when should we stop it? And I would like to go through this table. Who is considered for nerve sparing? Almost every of our patients is considered for nerve sparing because we know that this is data from Germany, that there is an incidence of prostate cancer over the years and over all the decades. And we know from the Massachusetts male aging studies, and then not a lot of other surveys that erectile function is not a matter of age. Erectile dysfunction is the problem of age, and therefore I stated up there, age is the enemy of success for radical prostatectomy and maybe even for other pelvic surgery, like in the visceral surgery, the rectum extirpation or something like that. The first good news is if it worked in the operation, and I almost focus now on the operation, but it's the same for the radiation therapy, it just starts a bit later, the erectile dysfunction, then you can consider your patients that it will last for the next years. This paper is from this year, and there you can see right after the radical prostatectomy, there's a great dip down with the sexual function, and here is the erectile function, and afterwards, after two years, then you come to a steady state and that will hold on for the next almost 10 years if you survive the next 10 years. And there you can see one very important point in the information of our patients. The blue dots are patients that are less than 60 years of age at the point of radical prostatectomy and the orange ones are the older ones. And if you're older, remember the enemy of success then you have less good choices to save your potency. This is a paper or a slide that I uh, regret. Professor Otto, he's the chief of the biggest rehabilitation clinic in Germany. And please keep in mind, almost 6,000 patients, or at that point they were men, not patients, because it was before the radical prostatectomy, they stated out how good was their erectile function before the operative treatment. And there you can see, as you know it, it declines with age. And the next question was, please keep that in mind, why is there such a discrepancy in the success rates after the radical prostatectomy? I think because we just talk about techniques. 
we are talking about the difference between antegrad or retrograd prostatectomy. We talk about the difference of retropubic, perineal, laparoscopic prostatectomies. And there, at that point, maybe here the battle is over. Okay, I know this paper is a bit old, but still there we saw over two years there comes a point of equi uh, equivalency. We can talk about the intrafacial or the extrafacial, the curtain dissection, and there you can see, and that is one of the problems I see, a potency re rate near 100%. It seems like it's better to get a radical prostatectomy to save erectile function than to just age. This paper, I think they show it very nice, and very clear, the nerve sparing uh, progress and the, uh, even if it's unilateral or bilateral, there you can see with age it declines in the success rates and that is the normal way we know even in the patients who come with other problems of erectile function in our departments or in our offices. And this is the truth four weeks after radical prostatectomy. The same Professor Otto from Bad Wildungen in Germany, 36 patients less, now they are patients four weeks after radical prostatectomy. And there was almost 95% before, and four weeks after radical prostatectomy, it's 2%. That is the truth. That's what the patients stated out. So that is that what we have to talk about. The next thing is, what is erectile function? Every one of us has a special idea about what is erectile function? I don't think so. I think we all have the same idea. But if you look in the papers, then you can see that unfortunately, overall, 37 of the reported series even not report how the authors defined adequate erections. What is adequate? Can we measure it with, I with the IIF? Can we measure it with other questions, like the sexual encounter profile? And I think the best thing is the paper from Briganti. He said, he stated out an IAF of more than 22 points. This is an erection hard enough and firm enough for successful sexual intercourse. That is the cutoff for erections or for the uh, sufficient or successful erection after bilateral nerve sparing or after unilateral nerve sparing, after nerve sparing. I think that is a very mandatory thing that we have to state out when we talk about potency, when we talk about sufficient erections. Where should we use them? Which patients should get rehabilitation protocols? And this is the second part of the paper from Salonia, and a lot of the colleagues here in the audience are co-authors and that, that paper, for example, Marcus Braden. And that is the second part where they stated out their uh, things about recovery and preservation of erectile function. And at the end, they concluded, however, no specific recommendation emerges regarding the optimal rehabilitation or the treatment regimen. And there is one statement be above that I think is very important. Young patients with a good preoperative erectile function who underwent radical prostatectomy, they can improve, may further improve about the postoperative outcomes. So is it a choose of patients or is it a choose of the individual person? Or is it a thing for two? Like intimacy, Sexual life is not always a thing just for the patient. It's a lot in most of the times. It's a, it's a part of two persons. It's bothering the partner as much as the patient. And this is from Japan, and maybe in Europe it's a bit other in the way. But I don't think that these percentages differ so much. And a significant higher rate of patients consider their sexual life important in comparison to their partners. It is 35% of the patients, it's not 100%, and only 13% of the partners. Maybe here they have fear about the life, about the rest of the life, about survival of their partners. And the hope for preservation of erectile functions, the patients 6% 6, 6 partners, 33%, maybe there is a part of satisfaction about the sexual life at that point, 
And don't forget, the typical patient is around 60. The typical patient in a German urological department is mid-60s, and a lot of those patients have partners with sexual problems, or even they have themselves sexual problems. And how is it after the radical prostatectomy? And there you can see that completely satisfied with the operative treatment in that case are only 41% of the patients after six months, 47 after 12 months. That's the natural history that erection re regains uh, with time. And at the partner side, 48%, 50%, more or less, just 50% of them are satisfied. And you can see that if there is a problem, here's the partner, there are the patients. If there is a, po a problem, over the time, it gets worsened. It, got, it got, starts with 66% problem on the partner side, uh, recommended the same. It got worse out of the partner's point of view over the time, sorry. And it grew up to, 80, uh, to 83% at 12 months. So we, don't have to keep, we have to keep in mind that it's always a, a thing for two. What protocols? You have seen a lot of studies in the last years. And I want to state out that even if you use sildenafil, you know that paper, or you use, in this part, you, you use vadenafil, and this was the great study, reinvent study, where <clears throat> the goal of the reinvent study was to demonstrate the hypothesis of pharmacological prophylaxis for the first time. That there is no pharmacological prophylaxis because it made no difference if you use placebo, Vardenafil or uh, daily or on demand, there is a significant difference between placebo and Vardenafil on demand. But if you look over the time, and I think that was the major information of this study, if you look over the whole time of two years, there was big success even with by time, so that you can say to your patients, you can choose. Maybe it's another thing if we change the drug at this time, we performed, or Francesco Montorsi and co-workers, they performed it with Tadalafil, even a wonderful name, the REACT study, and you can see it by this sheet, it was a tremendous work to do that, and the results are the same as with Vardenafil or with Sildenafil, and I'm sure it would be the same with Mirodenafil or with Avanafil, if we get, we get these drugs here in Europe available also. Even there, there's a significant increase change in IIEF, but is it a wonderful thing for the patient if it changed from 10 to 17? Remember Briganti, 22 points you need for a sufficient direction. By the way, they measured the penile length. Whoever participated in the study with penile measurements in patients, you know how hard it is to measure a difference of two millimeters. Never forget that. When should we stop, or what is reality? How can we treat, how can we talk to our, our patients about what we are doing? First of all, we have to think about what we are doing. This is data from Germany. Mrs. Herkammer, she is now in Munich. She was former in Ulm. And the red bars are how the patients see our treatment. And the green bars is, is that what the urologist said that they recommended to their patients. And very important is the vac vacuum constriction device compared to the PDE5 inhibitors. Because we know that the female sexual function index is really diminished if you're using a vacuum constriction device. And there you can see the urologists said they think that only 20% of them are using it. But the truth is almost 50% of the patients got one of these constriction devices. Okay, there's a reason in the insurance policy in Germany because that is paid and the PD-5 inhibitors, they are going along with a high satisfaction rate in partners and patients. They aren't paid by the insurances. And the urologist said, okay, we are very modern. We are almost 40% of us are prescribed those PD-5 inhibitors for the patients, but the truth was almost 20%. So we have to keep that in mind. Okay, I'm a German, so I took that first, but you, honestly, it's not 
even differing in the US. There they made a study with almost 700 colleagues, private and academic institutes, and they asked, what rehabilitation strategies do you have? And you can see it here by the bars, it's a whole mix. It's the same situation, and I'm sure, maybe even in Swiss, it's the, it's the same mix. So we don't have a real considered strategy. When? When shall, uh, shall we start? Right after the catheter removal, or in the, those very motivated patients during the operative time in the, in the hospital stay, or later, or can we wait up to the two years, as we know it now from the Montorsi study with uh, Vardenafil, even there, a complete mix, no straight strategy from the urologists. The same is how long do we treat our patients? How long do we go aside with them? We think we companion them very long. 75% of the urologists think they are doing a long therapy with the, with the patients. But that is what the patient is feeling about. 70% claimed that only a very short therapy, a very short accompanying was done by the urologists. This even in the US, the same. They can see it, the duration of rehabilitation, also a big mix, less than 12 months, one fourth. Okay, here is a bit better, 12 to 18 months, but it's not that, that we can see it over the whole time of at least 24 months where the natural history of rehabilitation starts or is, is gaining. And that is the same with the preferred timing to start rehabilitation. It differs from immediately 10% over the whole time, then four to eight months was the latest ask here, or when the patient is requesting it, that what we learned from the Montorsi study. So what can we conclude? What is the best patient? How is the motivation of the patients for <coughs> sexual rehabilitation, for erectile rehabilitation? And I think we have to keep that in mind. We have to keep in mind if the patient had sufficient erections before, or shall we do it like a Brazilian group did it? Shall we implant a penile prosthesis at the time of radical prostatectomy? They had 100% erectile function afterwards. So, my personal view is we have the great opportunity to talk to the patient and to do an individualized therapy demanding of the personal expectations of the patients and then we can decide who, what, and when, referring to the six honest men they taught me all I know. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Dr. Unimon. How about, very, thank you very much. Nice presentation. I have a comment and a question, of course. The question is, what do you offer if you fail and if you stop rehabilitation? And we changed our concept of rehabilitation. We stop after one year and we start offering penile implants. And um, because there are many new uh, devices on the market, particularly the, um, the, the one from Coloplast, where you don't need to open up the body and it's, it's wonderful, a wonderful device. But the important issue and the important message to this is, unfortunately, I can't recall the name of the lady who presented it at the EAU. And she did a study on prostitutes. And she was looking, asking who is more satisfying, the man with a prosthesis versus the man without the prosthesis. Guess who won? The prosthetic, the man, yeah, the man the with prosthetic the prosthetic. one. So maybe you should offer the patient more early <coughs> the prosthesis. And why we do that before one year <coughs> is over? It's because of the Sato group. Because they showed that if the lady, the partner, is not modified, and if she is not enthusiastic. However, whatever good surgeon you had, you will be impotent after one year. I think this statement is very, very important because we know that the satisfaction rates after penile prosthesis implant is very high if the partner is motivated. If the partner doesn't want to use the thing, <laughs> you don't have to implant it. And that's the same after radical prostatectomy. And that's the reason why I said you have the opportunity to do individualized therapy. You don't have to motivate 
a patient who hadn't had sex for 20 years that he now has to get erections because that is our goal of perfect radical prostatectomy that he is continent and potent. If he doesn't want to, leave him. Or maybe, yeah, okay. Even if he is not talking to his wife. Uh, but individualized therapy. Well, maybe just one question to Dr. Uniman. Uh, the, the costs of the prosthesis, are they paid by the insurance companies? Well, that's the reason why you don't have a reimbursement for the Da Vinci in Germany. <laughs> uh, uh, no, no. The, the, the penile prosthesis implant numbers didn't rise as much as you expect. It's only a small rising in the last uh, years. But <laughs> The idea is quite good. <laughs> well, another question would be, what is your personal approach to these patients which are non-responders for the PDE5 inhibitors? Are you offering then the intercovernosal injection and how well is it appreciated by the patients? Um, first of all, I, I do that. I, um, I give the patient the opportunity for an intercarinosal injection and I start with a very, very low amount of PGE1 because they have, uh, those patients after radical prostatectomy, they have pain very often if you are taking too high, uh, the dose too high. So start with 5 micrograms or, or even with 2.5 micrograms and um, if they don't have pain and if it is successful, then the expecta uh, acceptation is uh, about 50 to 60 percent because we know that the adherence rate to intracavernosal injection is around about 50 percent over the time. Well, I, I still believe that ICI is a good alternative for yeah. this patient and it, 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 little, it, it seems to me that it is a little bit underestimated and uh, maybe patients should be convinced to use ICI rather than go for a prosthesis implantation. Hmm. I think it's a, it's a problem of time because at the beginning of erectile function therapy or erectile dysfunction therapy, we only had ICI and all the patients were on ICI and we, we made much more effort on solving problems with the ICI like the pain after radical prostatectomy or how can we use it, as how much should uh, the dose be. Nowadays with the PD-5 inhibitors, we don't focus so much on ICI anymore, and we have this data that ICI is not as good as PDE 5 inhibitors, especially from the partner's point of view, and that's why it diminishes in the acceptance very much in the last year. But I would uh, agree it's still a good alternative. Herbert, I have a question. What influence has um, cost and uh, reimbursement? PDE 5 inhibitors are not reimbursed. How does this affect um, the acceptance of the patient, or what is he? What is it? normal patient willing to pay to improve his uh, erectile function? Um, I think that is the reason why we have 50% vacuum constriction devices because the normal patient isn't possible to pay 10 euros per tablet. Luckily now the prices diminishes. We are now on 3 euros per, per tablet per medication and I think that will change the point of view uh, from the pa uh, patient's uh, side a bit to the PD-5 inhibitors. But there's still the reimbursement problem. But I would say this is not lifestyle. Like, like those why we have this reimbursement policy in Germany, this is definitely a disease after a malignant disease. Mm. But still costs play a role and if yeah. the price for the robot will go down, we will have it also in Germany much more often. <laughs> okay, I think we have to stop the discussion. About